Good evening, everybody, and uh, I would like to start by thanking the three Irish members who started our program for us with uh, Love's Sweet Song. An Irish song that was well known to James Boyce while he was uh, working and writing uh, Ulysses. And tonight, uh, we will try to understand why and how Ulysses dared to fail to change our lives. Because as we will find out, this is exactly what James Joyce intended. Ulysses is a turn point in literature. In his contemporary life, T.S. Eliot once said, how could anyone write again after achieving the immense prodigy of the last chapter? Of course, referring to the chapter of Molly's soliloquy. The encyclopedic book is also a defining element of the life of the city where it's set. A city that was to become Joyce Ithaca is Jerusalem, or as he coined it for his protagonist, Bloom, his Blumusalem. It was a place to dream of, similar to the Catholic prelates who come to sign each day with different saints. Joyce has cunningly set aside a single day of the year on which to celebrate a feast. And when Leopold Bloom and Stephen Douglas sit down together at the book's climax for the coffee and the bun, None of them says, do this in memory of me. No, but every year the cult grows. And like all such cults, it has its roots of pilgrimage, special food and ritual observances and priestly decoders of the sacred text as its ritual of servants and as is the case with all emergent religions, the cult of James Joyce, known jocularly as the Feast of St. Jem Jews in Dublin, has formed its own loyal opposition. Well, when the centenary Doomsday was celebrated almost seven years ago, six and a half years ago, on June 16, 2004, and 10,000 Bloomsday breakfasts where served on the streets of Dublin, a spray painter, a graffiti artist, went to work and wrote, Bloom is a cop on a perfect side wall. There were no inverted or perverted commas around the quotation. Yet every year, hundreds of Dubliners dress as characters from the book, Stephen with his cane, Leopold with his fowler hat, Molly in her petticoats, blaze boiler under a straw bolt, as if to assert their willingness to become one with the text. But what is even more extraordinary is that Bloom's Day is celebrated in Paris, in Boston, in Texas, as far away of Adelaide in Australia. And everybody is reenacting scenes in Echo Street 7, in Ormond K, and the Sandy Cruz Martello Tower. So it's quite impossible to imagine any other masterpiece of modernity that did or might still have such an effect on the life of a city and of so many times. And yet, one wants to ask the obvious question. How many of those celebrants, of those pagan rite participants, did actually read the book through? Ernest Hemingway worshipped Joyce as the leader of intellectuals in the Paris of 19th century, get his copy of Ulysses with a dedication 
lies in the John F. Kennedy Library with all but the early and the late pages. Well, many of the early editions put on sale by art auctioneers seem not to have known the first reader's life. Yates, William Butler Yates, once read the first chapter or two of Ulysses, which had been serialized in the little review from Paris, and his first comment was, this is a mad book. But that later, not much later though, he said, I've made a terrible mistake. The work of perhaps genius. I now perceive its coherence. It is an entirely new thing, neither what the eye sees nor the ear hears, but what the rending mind drinks and imagines from the moment to moment. He has certainly surpassed in intensity any novelist of our time. Forget and forgive my Irish terrible accent. In Ulysses, Joyce sets out to change the world and to liberate its readers who unsettled aunt to his preferred aunt, who said about the book that it was not worth reading. He said, if Ulysses is not worth reading, life is not worth living. But now it seems the book is more famous for the prices of which it first edition received when they changed hands, while Joyce would doubtless have enjoyed the drinks and drapes of Doomsday, he might also have sadly noted in the attempt by Dubliners to reassert the lost sense of community, this sense of loss that followed him all his life. He would actually rarely come back to the beloved Isaka, to Dublin. Celebration of Bloomsday may in fact be a lament for a lost city, a city that is eternalized between the pages of Ulysses, Ulysses, a book that was kidnapped by academia, but about that in a little while. Ulysses appeared just as the curricular study of English literature at university really took off. The books which set out to restore the dignity of the middle range of human experience against a false heroic of World War I were soon lost to the common reader. James Joyce, once in a party in uh, Geneva, and was approached by a general who was telling everybody in the party about his adventures during the First World War. And when uh, Joyce turned around and picked up a drink, he spilled some of the drink on the general, of course, not a good. And the general said to everybody, no, 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 that's okay. No, not to worry, not to worry. Uh, nice to see you here with us, uh, Mr. Uh, Joyce. And uh, what did you do during the years of the war? Joyce just looked at him and immediately said, I wrote Ulysses. What did you do? Bloom, uh, Ulysses is arguably one of the major artworks to register the effects of that conflict on ordinary man. Bloom's uncertain sexual potency, though an element of a book set in 1904, seemed to prefigure the impotence of damaged protagonists of writers such as Hemingway, Eliot, Lawrence, Bellow, while his emphasis on the need for a tolerant and peaceful response to the experience of betrayal held many lessons for a world just emerging out of one Europe to war, 
and we're ready to plant the edge of the harbor. Joyce understood from the very start that the death cult that those enlisted for military service in 1914-18 died with death in order to heighten their sense of being alive. He was quick to foresee that this death cult arose out of the disillusions of everyday life. He intuited a link between a more democratic politics and a belief in the significance of people's quotidian practices. In making the central character in Ulysses an ordinary and Jewish citizen, he may have even foreseen that the Jews could easily become victims of a general disenchantment with the complications of modernity. To make the rejection of everyday life, of work, of happiness, of mass phenomenon rather than just a response of baffled individuals like the French soldiers and with Lefebvre, you end up with the Hitler scene. A book which set out to celebrate the common man and his women, a beautiful sad and melancholy fate of never being read by most of those common people. Was this a case of bad faith or bohemian hypocrisy in a work which I dear love just the sort of simple souls who could never hope to read it? Did Joyce make a bad choice when he preferred Ulysses to Jesus as a model for Bloom? But now the choice was good. Living with a woman. או שאת חבית המשלמה אם את רוצה לעשות דברים, כי פשוט אני מנסה להציל מה שאני יכול ולהקליט את זה, אבל אם את רוצה את זה וזה, הם לא רואים אותי אצלי. When asked, Joyce was hurt. Living with a woman was one of the most difficult things a man could do. And Jesus was a bachelor who never tried it. If Joyce was haunted by the mystery he felt, it was said to have admired only the unchangeable, the mystery of Christ and the mute drama that surrounds it. Joyce was someone who snooped around old texts, looking for a back door through which to effect an entry. The New Testament was one such text and a major element in the creation of Ulysses. What fascinated him was the audacity with which the gospel authors cannibalized and rewrote the Old Testament. But if he would reconfigure earlier classics, making a Ulysses both their fulfillment and itself an open prophetic book. Pierce Elliott added later that Ulysses manipulates a continuous parallel between contemporary and antiquity, and that the very technique he calls the mythical method has the importance of a scientific discovery. Ulysses was wrenched out of the hands of the common reader. Why? Because of the rival specialists prepared to devour the book and devote years and years to the study of its secret codes, parallax, indeterminacy, the consciousness, time being among the buzzwords. Such specialists often tend to work in teams. Many of them reject the notion of a national culture, assuming that to be cultured nowadays is to be international, even global, 
and consciousness. In doing so, they have often removed Deutsch from the Irish context, which gave his work so much of its meaning and value. Who is this to shape in a world which has known for the first time the possibility of mass literacy and the emergence of working man reading the libraries? Virginia Woolf, perhaps unintentionally, captured that element when she sneered at it in the book as the book of a self taught Dublin working man, adding, it would have been quite an enchanting entertainer, but the writer, me. Joyce never shied away from being an entertainer. Eurytus is not an intellectual puzzle. And though some passages might seem obscure to the first reading, it's because we are taught to expect something different in a novel, a narrative, well-drawn characters, confrontations, etc., etc. All these exist in Ulysses. But at such an inflated form, the being too close, we often fail to see the whole. The book starts off pre-announcing that it's going to be a book full of music. And it starts off with Buck Monaghan, the somewhat plump radical student who shares Stephen Devil's Martello Tower. And Buck Monaghan offers grace to the Dublin Bay as seen from atop the tower. Let's listen to the Introibo del Parete, which appears right at the beginning of the book. But this is not by far the only musical illusion in Ulysses. Even the most casual reader of Ulysses must soon become aware of Joyce's use of music in the novel. Since the time that Hodgard and uh, Livingston first pioneered the existence of the illusion of music in Ulysses, we have begun to appreciate how many musical references Joyce uses. Still to be completely explored, and still giving the goal to about 10, 15, sometimes even 50 
doctoral thesis every year. His methods of applying the musical allusions in the novel are different. Sometimes it's the style of the music, sometimes it's the structure, the theme. I propose to outline briefly some of the musical references, uh, motives and uh, techniques used in the Ulysses, and then try to discuss each and every one of the examples. In a great number of passages, Bruce Joyce uses a musical reference as a vehicle of association of the stream of consciousness of the protagonist, Leo Bloom, uh, sometimes through the actual words of the song, sometimes through the images and implications that the song produce, and sometimes for no <laughs> apparent reason at all, just that it seemed to be in place for James Joyce. Joyce and Boyce, musical thematically throughout the book, to represent situations and dilemmas, particularly the Molly Blaze liaison. After the Telemachus chapters, only the Wandering Rocks episode lacks music allusion to Molly's adultery. Once certain works such as La Chitarem, uh, Love's old sweet song and Mapari have been established as being representative of Molly Bloom affair. The recurrences of the song serve to remind us that the subject is never far from Bloom's thought or the central action of the book. A central action, though, that some people talk about Bloom or always thinks about, but actually we are never sure whether this actually happened or not. Let's hear La ci darem la mano.
this is green circles and uh, the top three mega singers uh, giving us the pleasure of Mozart's uh, La Fidarema La Mano from Don Giovanni. And let's not forget that in Don Giovanni, it's not because he's so charming that he has to have every woman. It's because he has a disease. He cannot fight it. And of course, in Bloom's mind, that's the easiest way to excuse his Serlina, his Molly, uh, because obviously she is part of a global universal play that is far beyond her understanding and beyond her grasp as a simple human being. And of course, then at the end, Joyce shows us <laughs> of an unsimple and very complex human being Molly actually is, like obviously each and every one of us. I would like now to uh, take a dive into chapter number 11 in the book uh, that James Joyce called the sirens, like the sirens in the, what do you say? Uh, we remember the sirens as those the mythical beauties that were the death of those who looked up at them. And uh, in the Odyssey, Odysseus or Ulysses had all his uh, sailors put wax in their ears so they wouldn't be attracted and casual by the uh, sirens, and he, the only one, tied himself to the must and listened to the song. Of course, here in Ulysses, it's the men in the Ottoman bar that try to seduce the two lovely maidens. Uh, the siren begins with poetry. But listen to this poem. Bronze by gold, heard the hoof tunes, steely ringing in the inn, chips, picking chips off rocky thumbnail, chips, horrid, and gold flushed more, and high sea, by boat blue, new blue bloom is on the gold, pinny. Here, a jumping rose on the breast of Stephen, filled with the steel, trailing, trailing, the Dolores, who is in the heap of gold, pink, cried to bronze in pity, and a coal, pure, long and throbbing, long in dying, cold, or a steward, but look. The bright stars fade. Notes chirping answer. Oh, rose, the steel. The morn is breaking. Dingle, dingle, dong, to jingling. And let's hear what we can listen from known popular songs of the era. Of the era. This is Matali, of course, from Martha, sung by Luciano Pavarotti.
beautiful Luciano. Let's not forget. And we think about it when you go back and read Ulysses for another time. That a little bit earlier in the uh, book, we find Bloom, Ulysses Bloom, as uh, Henry Flower receiving a letter from his unknown, unalphabetic typist, whose name is Martha. And here, to his mind, comes. Martha, tu sparissi, you disappeared from my life and made it so terrible. Although with Martha, Bloom himself has never had anything beyond the letters exchanged. Let's go back to Ormond Bank Bar in the silence. Coin rang, clock clacked, a barrel, sonne. I could, rebound of Garter, not leave the smack, laplosh, sigh, smack, a bow, warm, sweetheart. Goodbye. Single blue, boom, crashing chords when light absorbs, or, or, the tympanum, a sail, a sail, a wave upon the waves. Horn is lost now. Horn, no horn. And first we saw, alas, full tuck, full from warbling, a lure, a luring Martha Kami. And here again we have Martha. Clap, clop, clip, clap, clappy, clap. Good God, Hennep. A hearted in all death bold pat, broad pad night took up, a moonlight night called far, far. Okay, so sad. Yes, so lonely. Woman. And uh, uh, listen. The spike and the wind and cold sea horn tell you the each. And for other clash and violent roar, hers when she lists rhapsodies. Is. Oh, you don't? Did not? No, no, the lead, 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 with a cock, with a cara, black, deep sounding, do, and do, wait, while you wait. <laughs> wait, while you <laughs> but wait Low, low in dark middle earth embedded or the mine is mine, creature is he all gone, all fallen, tiny, a tremulous foreign foil of maiden here. Amen Ignorant in fury Drop to fro Button cool, protobing, bronzidia, my, by, my, my gold. By bronze, by gold, in ocean green, a shadow. Ah, bloom, old bloom, and what comes to mind? Franz Schubert.
and this uh, kind of scherzo by Schubert was the very song with which James Boyce's father once won a national competition for tennis. But uh, it's the sound, the blume, the flower. Henry Flower, in the beginning, has a strange affair with a typist whom he never met. And uh, all of a sudden, out of memories, the name Bloom becomes itself a flower because of the German connotation. But let's go back to the siren, the beginning of the siren. One rapped, one tapped with a cutter, with a cock. Pray for him. Pray, good people. Gouty fingers, knackering. Big Ben, Ben, Big Ben, Ben, let throes of thirsty of summer, let bloom. I feel so sad alone. Chip, <laughs> little wing, piped we, true man. Little cow, de and dull, I, I like you, man. Will lift your chink with a chunk? Oh! Will bronze from a near? Will gold from a far? Where oops? Crap, crando. Then, not till then. I, a bridge has been built with. Done. Let's begin. And so we go into the action. But what comes to mind? Uh, these were the Disney uh, soloists who gave us their version of Cuckold and Muscle. Beautiful song, which tells as a popular song. Uh, it tells the story of Molly, the fisher girl, and it brings us to her death because of what she did, uh, which is never, never very clear in the song. And of course, to bloom, it's the sound cock. Uh, he is going to be a cockled man. He's going to grow horns on his head because of Molly. 
and somewhere inside there is an idea that maybe there's a revenge down the road. Because as in the song, Moggy does not come from a very high uh, breeding. In the song, she is the daughter of fishes. A fish mongoose, not a fisherman. And uh, in life, it's only late, late in the story, but we'll find out that, <coughs> sorry, that Molly comes from uh, Rome, the gypsies, I mean, uh, half Spanish, half gypsy, half Jewish, half everything, uh, a lot of thoughts that would make one perfect human being, Molly. I would like to thank you very much too, for being with us here tonight. And uh, I hope that this brought a wish to your heart and a kind of a dream to your mind. Open up Ulysses. All the dreams are engulfed in the words and in the music and in the scenes and in the characters and in the stream of consciousness. And until the next time, I'd like to wish you a very good evening to hear from Usopia Reminds Meets Online. Bye.